Mini episode 160 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by TV Howl, your home on the web for coverage of today's television scene and a look at the history of the medium as covered by big-time TV critic Adam Buckman. Follow them on the web at tvhowl.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late-night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. All right, folks, mini episode number 160, and this is part 2B of the Kyle Ross History of SummerSlam anthology here in the FDH Lounge. Rick Morris. Well, it's a bit and of a Kyle chuckle Ross. when you yeah. introduce that thing, as in, what other perverse ass would you think would make me do something like this? <laughs> and, uh, and Kyle, I can honestly say there's no other perverse ass that I would rather work with than you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Kimo Savi. It, uh, we are here. By the way, the real question is, do you miss me? I believe, and, and, yeah. not you, Big Ron. Yeah. You remarked on my Reagan shirt when I got yeah. here. I always like to wear things to provoke you. Yes. Like that, well, so. yeah, there's nothing like quite like provoking. Yes, yeah. you, you certainly uh, chuckled the one time I was wearing my Sports Center T-shirt that my brother got me for Christmas. Yes. <laughs> by the way, I understand you once walked by Ronald Reagan and you said, "Who?" Oh, <laughs> hey now, oh, <laughs> that's just wrong. Yes. Ron for Rushmore <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So we're here. This is so oh my god! I'm not going to let you get away. That is <laughs> nauseating. Yeah, what? You don't no, like that? No. You're not, you're not going to no. sign my internet petition? No. I can assure you, if I was involved at all with the production of this particular program, that would get edited right out. Okay, <laughs> quicker than NBC edited out that tribute or whatever that was. Okay. Yeah. yeah. During the Olympics. NBC disrespecting military heroes since 1975. <laughs> You're out of line early yes, in this I podcast. <laughs> Speaking of out of line, how about we get to SummerSlam 96? How about this? Yeah, and it's it, 96 and 97. They're the ones we're talking about here today. And again, this is coming out of the shadow of 95. I wanted to start by talking about this as far as um, the ramifications of of that year. We know 1995 as being the year, as we alluded to uh, toward the tail end of the last one, where the Monday Night Wars started. Monday Nitro debuting shortly uh, on uh, TNT right after uh, SummerSlam of that year. But earlier in the year, with the start of the In Your House pay-per-views in the WWF, they were following the lead. WCW was already starting to go down this path of just about monthly pay-per-views. And you and I have talked in many, 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 many episodes in the past here as far as the early years of pay-per-view, it was a straddle between getting enough people to buy a, a pay-per-view but still come to the house shows. After 95, house shows were just strictly, they're an important revenue stream as far as it goes, but nowhere near the end-all, be-all. They're an adjunct. It's The build is pay-per-view to pay-per-view to pay-per-view, and SummerSlam 96 is the first SummerSlam of that era. And that was especially the case in WCW. I mean, that's, again, yes. different podcast for a different day, but, I mean, you know, they're the top guys. Right. You know, the NWO had started by this point, but even before that, right. they, their top guys weren't doing house shows, and by their top guys, I mean Hogan. Right. Largely. That's what, true. The last month, there was not a pay-per-view. A company didn't do a pay-per-view. WCW, January of 96. Yeah. Starting with February of 1996, both companies ran a pay-per-view every month. Yeah. And that uh, that put us into the era that we're in. And I would say that somewhere, well, I can tell you when it was. It's pretty obvious when, when Hall and Nash jumped to the other team. Mm-hmm. Starting with the Great American Bash, because people forget the early part of 96 in WCW, they didn't know which way they were going. Really. There were some dog pay-per-views. Super Brawl's not very good. Uncensored was hideous. Right. Uh, Slamboree wasn't exactly setting the world on fire. They, they still did the old Lethal Lottery. Actually, I don't think WCW did a pay-per-view in April of 96, come to think of it. So, correction on that earlier Spring statement. Spring Stampede? No, the first one was in 97. There was no Spring Stampede 96. There was a spring stampede in like 94. 
Did they take a couple of they, years they off? They didn't do 195. I'm positive there wasn't a spring stampede in 96, so, believe it or not. 94 was that swank flare steamboat <laughs> match. And the, the cactus uh, Max That's Payne. Right. Boys, but okay. No, there, there was not. So okay. April, unless if I'm missing, so April 96, WCW didn't run a pay-per-view, which made sense because it would have been opposite WrestleMania 12. And uh, that's, that's when Hogan was gone anyways. Yeah, but... Starting with the Great American Bash in the summer, I'll make it. I can remember this. I was way more looking forward to Nitro yep. and WCW pay per views around this time period than I was Raw and WWF pay per views, and that had never, ever been the case in my wrestling watching lifetime until about June of '96. So you have WCW with what, or pardon me, WWF with what I feel is arguably the worst summer slam. It certainly had the least amount of intrigue going in in 1996 where you had the right main events. You know, they didn't do something wacky creatively and just have something horrible. Uh, you can't disagree with the main event of Shawn Michaels versus Vader, but in many ways, this was pretty indicative of why they were getting their tail kicked. Uh, but, and, and when I say tail kicked, it was still relatively close, believe it or not. But Vader as your challenger, was basically a washed-out WCW guy. He had been fired the previous year by Eric Bischoff. Yeah. And Sean, as great as he was as a performer, did not draw well on top as a babyface champion. Right. And this was sort of compared... I mean, look, they have a great match. It's a top borderline, top ten SummerSlam match of all time. I, they did a lot of those goofy restarts because the rumor right. was Vader was supposed to go over here and Sean, right. being Sean at the time, refused to do the job. Right. Uh, I, I don't, again, I'm, you know, I'm not excusing Sean. People always, you know, back in the SNS days, always thought I excused Sean for his, his refusal to do jobs. But not a lot of them, I thought, adversely affected business. This compared, one did. I don't think it did. I don't think Vader would have done anything on top. Uh, I, I don't. That's That was my, I don't think he Vader would have been a good champion for, for Sean to chase, though. It would have been good to see the shoe on the other foot. It would have been, I mean, here's the thing. They could have had Sean then regain it. At yeah. MSG at that's, Survivor Series. That's about what I would have done. But yeah, I mean, again, I mean, it would, if it, the title reign would have been a footnote in history. Yeah, maybe. But you know, I look at it here it, it's again. A, it's a fun match. I'll right. say this, it, and it's of course fame for Sean berating, of course, pro, true pro that he is berating Vader mid match for being out of position as a spot and literally throwing a temper tantrum in the middle of the match. I've still never seen that. I got to look for that on YouTube or something. I, I have to see You've that. You've never moment. seen the. Temper- I've never seen that moment. He was out of position. I I've heard she, about it. I've I heard think, you talk about it. I don't a lot. know if Sean was supposed to do like a moon salt or just like a cross body off the top salt, rope yeah. and Vader wasn't in the right spot and he kind of just jumped down punts him in the head and starts screaming at him Mick Foley the next month at Mind Games mm-hmm. which was an even better match than this they actually worked off that spot because <laughs> Foley thought it was really funny and they had Sean yell at him it was a total work that time oh, that's pretty hilarious. Funny. Foley wrote about it in, I think his first book it's, that, that's or, hilarious. it's funny well with, with Sean being on top we referenced this during the last mini episode the different eras of part two here, the, the history of I uh, love Summer orange Slam. juice, by the way. It, uh, yeah, you look like you're enjoying that. Uh, it was, Bret Hart was the one that was on top in 92 and in 93. Lex Luger, the only one of these guys not to be champion, but he was the top dog there. Then it went back to Bret. Then it went to Diesel. This is now the part where Sean is on top here. And in Bret was, and, and here's the thing that yeah. makes this work. This is why I think the Summer Slam was the worst. Yeah, they were switching those guys. It was mm-hmm. kind of a revolving door who was the top. But they were all around, which made for at least a little bit of star power. Right. Lex Luger. Let's flash forward to Summer 76. Lex Luger in WCW. Yeah. Kevin Nash, WCW. Ooh, yeah. Scott Hall, WCW. Bret Hart sitting on the sidelines uh, for some contract negotiations. I'm not sure. This was still slightly before he had signed officially. Oh, it was. It was. Now, he might have still been – because remember – he was doing some international shots here and there, but he was never on camera until he came back. Yeah. So even if he was doing the South Africa shots, it's completely irrelevant to what they were doing here. And he, here's another thing, too. They did have a rising star on that roster. Remember the, the little pay-per-view happened called King of the Ring 96, yeah. uh, where you know Steve Austin became a superstar. But you know WWE must not have seen it, because he's on the free-for-all in the show against Yokozuna. Yeah. A baby-faced Yokozuna, where they do a... Funky finish where the rope breaks and he rolls him up. In 152, Yokozuna so, was way on his way down the card. Yeah, yeah I mean, I mean this undercard. Yeah. Un- I mean, look, Sean didn't draw well, Ricky. Yeah. I'm not going to say that. He, he deserves blame well, for also, that. Also, but- syndication died on his watch. We talk about yes. the, the, the changing of the industry. That's yes. the third pillar. Syndication pretty much yeah, was a mo- non-factor yeah, after 96. Yeah, yeah right. 
you know, when I was a kid, Ricky, and you were you're a little older than me, you were a kid. Yeah. Saturday and Sunday was wrestling day for yeah. me. You know, it was yeah. You know, it was cartoons were over. Maybe they were still even on in some markets. You know, you'd wait for Spotlight and Superstars. It was here on right. nineteen. I, you probably the same stations. Yeah. Here, I mean, as a kid, you know, it was Spotlight at ten a.m., Superstars at eleven a.m. on Saturdays. And then you'd Wrestling Challenge at eleven a.m. on Sundays. Mm-hmm. Um, Monday night was now wrestling night uh, in 1996. So you're right, syndication night, that's an excellent point. Yeah. Um, but Sean, look, he, he wasn't great on top, but he did not have – he was certainly the highlight of every pay-per-view where he was champion, at least yeah. from an in-ring perspective. Because when you look at underneath on this show, I mean, whoa. There are some guys that were over to various degrees. I'm looking at matches here. Psycho Sid defeated the Bulldog at 624. Sid Probably had, not a great match, no, but Sid was kind of an over baby face. He had just point. come back to just replace back. the ultimate warrior yeah. on the, who, who went to no and shock, failed miserably, and yeah. then walked. Uh, he did the, one of the great... I'll be honest with you, this is something that only a few people will probably be able to confirm. You'll mm-hmm. have to watch it, kids. Uh, put this one on. One of the best power bombs he ever did to beat Davey Boy Smith here. Okay. It's a great power bomb. Yeah. <laughs> he uh, he could always execute that. He was like a one move kind of a yeah, guy. No, no, but, but I mean, it, it was. I'm not, like the, this might have been his best one. He did. It just came across looking great. I remember. Yeah, he was he was capable of that from time to time. Uh, you know, you're, you're. This was before they were doing old timers matches on a regular basis. But uh, Jerry Waller defeated Jake Roberts the, at four oh seven. Again, Waller had. I remember this was in Cleveland. This was like the first event at yeah. uh, the Gund Arena, which is now Quick Arena. I was Loans laughing Arena. about this with Waller the one time he was on the show that it was personally painful for him as a real life Browns fan. He had to put on a Ravens jersey to come out and bait the crowd. Yeah, he did that. <laughs> and then he also poured the Jack Daniels, which Jake, Don Jake Roberts smiled. And we all know Jake Roberts' story. And Jake, you know, on his DVD, Pick Your Poison, which I think is the most underrated mm-hmm. WWE DVD, by the way, didn't like that. At all, he thought that. I mean, that Jake, you know, you always got to take him with a grain of salt. He was but, already off the off the wagon, so he was probably welcoming it at yeah, this point. Yeah, he's like, yeah. Hey, do the spot again. No, yeah. but um, <laughs> but hey, hey, King, hey, King, can we involve any crack in this no, next one? Oh, jeez. <laughs> but you know, it, again, that was this kind of had heat, but it was kind of like God compared to what they're doing cheapy. at WCW, which yeah. was using old guys as well. Right. This just. It's funny that WCW is using old guys that came right. across as really cool. This came across as a total nostalgia trip. Right. I uh, totally did. Uh, the other one's on here, too. Um, uh, nothing really of note that I'm looking at here except the, the, the match that was probably, you know, well, no, no, not probably. It definitely was. The semi-main event, the Boiler Room Brawl. Mankind defeated The Undertaker at 2640. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This was a point where... You, know, you said off air you weren't really sure that this had a whole lot of significance to it. I kind of think it did because well, this is when I think you started to see the point. I think it's no coincidence that the next year The Undertaker had been integrated into the main event picture and was, it was WWF champion. This is the transition, as I see it, from moving out of strictly dealing with the cartoon characters. Mick Foley's Mankind was not a pure cartoon character. He was a guy who could work and everything like that. I think that this was The Undertaker moving more towards, and again, Mankind was a cartoonish character in some ways. I don't want to say the start of The Undertaker moving towards reality stuff, but the the start of The Undertaker getting in touch with what would become the Attitude Era. I see the seeds of it here. That's a great point, Ricky. Um, you talked about the cartoon. I mean, this... You can't even compare when, Mankind's when you, character to Giant Gonzalez or any yeah, of those guys. Yeah, exactly. When you, when you see Undertaker still around in 2012, and right. I certainly rolled my eyes at Raw 1000 when he came out to chokeslam the mid-card one more time. <laughs> and you're like, God, you know, can't you just show up at WrestleMania? Sometimes you think back, you're like, God, this guy did have a lot of the, his prime years wasted against some awful opponents. You referenced Giant Gonzalez, right. you know, I'll raise you the Kamalas, the Yokozunas, the Mabels. The Kamas, uh, the King Kong Bundys. I mean, you name it. He wrestled against every awful heel during that period. Yep. And Foley was a departure because the script was so similar. Right. During that, cart- okay, they stole the the cartoon guy stole the urn. Mm-hmm. The Undertaker would win the match and get it back. Yep. And they just it was just a freak show stuff. Foley, if you remember, beats him at King of the Ring, kind of shocking fashion. I mean, mm-hmm. no one saw that coming. The match wasn't particularly great, but. Foley seemed to have the Undertaker's number. You're right. It was a different kind of Undertaker feud. They really changed the character. Mm-hmm. 
And obviously, what everyone remembers from here is the big Paul Bearer heel turn, which yep. I called, by the way, in 1996. I'll really? remember. Oh, wow. I called that. I, okay. I wasn't the only one who called it. It, it was kind of obvious because Paul Bearer was, like, screwing up interference. Oh, my Undertaker. Yeah. But um, we interviewed Paul Bearer, by the way. I remember once I remember. He was a very good guy. Yes. Uh, he had, I think he made some kind of bizarre statement when he came on. That was weird. After that, though, it was, it was a great interview. Well, Just, he said he liked Bob Holly, so that would count, wouldn't it? <laughs> do, 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 do. Yeah. Um, but that's what it was known for. And it was really shocking at the time because, you know, this smelled like, in classic WWF sense, the baby face winning a grudge match. And it wasn't. Exactly. It was anything but that. Yeah. It was, and, of course, we, I think we need to talk about the production yeah. of this match. It was unlike anything you'd seen before. Right. A lot of it was pre-taped. It was in the back of the arena, and it's funny. This is pre-Titantron era, yep. so if you were there, I actually was not at this event, even though it was mm-hmm. in Cleveland. I was not. I, I did not particularly care for the WWF product at this time as much I as I like Sean. I was there, if I remember correctly. He was, and yeah. that's how I know what I'm about to tell you. They just had like these TVs roll out for the crowd. Yeah. I'm... Can you imagine if you were like at the top of the building, like I, you could barely watch the TV. And even worse, I understand that uh, you know at least one of them was a 19-inch one. I can't believe that would have uh, that could have done much for anybody, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Really, it's just like it's one of those things that you know people are like all oh, the boiler room brawl. You know, it's you know we made it seem like it's this real big thing, but when you right. watch it, it's not that compelling to watch on right. tape. It's kind of boring, right? The actual heel turn is great, and Jim Ross, by God, a seven-year friendship has been, a a seven-year bond has been broken, you know, that whole (laughs) steal. They were kind of taking the the muzzle off JR during this time period. Yeah. Um, Heel JR, by the way, would rear its uh, ugly head in a couple months, I think, after this, which was funny for about two weeks. With faux diesel and faux razor. Well, that's when it stopped being funny. Mm -hmm. Uh, But. And got real. Yeah. (laughs) Yes, yes. (laughs) Uh, Thank you, Eric Neese. Um, (laughs) Does anyone know who that is? But. I just thought that overall, I think this is the worst. You, I remember way back. Let's bring a full circle here, and then then we'll then because things do take an uptake from here for the first time after this show. I eighty eight is really bad, ninety is really bad. I'm talking about Summer Slams, not years in general. <laughs> ninety five is really bad. The year I think those are the four worst. Clearly, up I, to this point, I, I think t- those four. I would. Like, when you look and then, you know, the next time we reconvene, our next set of SummerSlams will be the Attitude Era, 98 through 2002. Mm-hmm. All those are good SummerSlams. So when you look at SummerSlam from 1988 to 2002, that is 15 years because we're doing five per taping session. Ricky. <laughs> Uh-oh. Well, I just broke kayfabe. Oh. Um, third wall. The four worst are clearly 88, 90, 95, and 96. I'm not sure what I would put in as the if, if I were to break them into thirds, you know, the five good ones, the five average, the five bad. I don't know if I can put any of the other ones with those. Those four are clearly the worst to me. See, but here's the thing, though. I don't, and, and maybe part of it is because you had a lot of crap that was shoehorned into the fatal four-way uh, match for the tag team championship. Oh, I'm glad, guns, I was hoping you weren't even going to reference that. the body new rockers and god ones. But here's the thing, though. Like, here's what ruins a lot of 93, 94, 95 for me. I can't get past the gimmicks. I hate the gimmicks of that time worse than just about anything. This this thing doesn't this card doesn't annoy me as much. There aren't guys that have X Pac heat with me like there are on the other ones. Yeah, I, the, Owen Hart defeated Savio Vega. I got no problem with watching either one of those okay guys. Match. Gold Dust defeated Mark Merrill. I mean, yeah, yeah, nothing great, but still, like. That made no sense because Barrow would go on to win the Intercontinental title like two weeks later. Yeah, it, it, well, it was it was weird. Well, they, they were notorious at SummerSlam. Like, uh, Bret Hart, not long before he defeated Diesel the year before for the title, could only get a count-out win over Isaac Yankum. They were notorious for not looking ahead with SummerSlam. But it's a thing where I would take this over probably 93, 94, and 95. Really? You, you know, but but I can't. But here's the thing, though. 94 but, I would probably put in this spot. I think it's close. Well, here's the thing. I just think those here, gimmicks made me vomit. I hate I hate that era of the WWF. I, I just well, hate so those gimmicks. So does Vince McMahon because they never talk about it. But I think that each one got worse that we've talked about. So 93, 94, 95, 96 is the way I look at it. If if you did put me, ask me to put that fifth one, I'd put 94. 93... Had some compelling stuff in the middle of it, whereas 94, 95, and 96, for me, were basically 
there was one great match each show. Mm-hmm. 94, Brett Owen. 95, Sean Razor. 96, Sean Vader. And there was sort of one other good match on it. Uh, 94, Razor Diesel was okay. Yeah. But 95, I don't know what it was. I mean, 95, there really wasn't. Right. 96, there really I mean, yeah, the Undertaker, you know. The, Boiler the, and Brawl was I ne- Never. See, that's why I, 94 gets a slight. You're right. The, these are three bad. I, I think I, I think I, But the Sean Vader, as far as the great match goes, here's mm-hmm. why I think this because of short, isn't as good as, as Sean Razor or no. Brett Owen. No, it's not. It's like a four and a quarter, four and a half star match, which it's is not. very good. But, yeah. I mean. It's it's not, but Sean had better matches during the title run. Uh, Vader had better matches in WCW, and this pretty much sunk Vader. By the way, uh, it did. Uh, th- this was this was really a big a nail in the coffin, and then he would subsequently lose. I think the next month to Sid for being the number one contender, which just you know, because well, I think Sean wanted to work with Sid, believe it or not, instead of Vader. Yeah, so. well, you know, to, to to a certain extent, they hadn't really resolved completely their storyline from the previous year. So they were able to revisit it yeah. uh, in that way. The thing that was notorious in this uh, second era of Summer Slams that we're looking at uh, collectively in these two parts here today, 93 through 97, was that every year it was a different uh, baby face on top of Summer Slam and almost always a different combination. You move ahead to 97, and what's interesting is we talked about the, the, the six different eras of who was on top somewhere in an amorphous sense, in ni- like Sean had abdicated early in '97. I think when Sean handed the title over, that was the end of because Sean didn't even wrestle WrestleMania. No, he was. That was the end of his run as the top babyface, yeah. right Cause, there. Because he had won the previous month at Royal Rumble in his hometown, right. a big stadium show. You know, yeah. he was clearly the focus of the promotion then. But yeah, you're very, right. Until very late in the game, he hands the title over. There were a couple months of fuzziness, I think, but by the summer of '97. It was clear that Steve Austin was going to be the next guy. And as you and I discussed off air, not clear that he was going to become the all-world megastar that he did, one of the, no. one of the five biggest stars in history. But by the summer of 97... The five no, biggest, I think that's kind of shortchanging the man, don't you? It, uh, well, Luthez says hi. But uh, <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I just wanted to get the look from you. No, uh, Luthez well, is a great man. Yeah. He once buried Hulk Hogan on that A&E show at Wrestling. Which I will never forget. Okay. Yeah, I thought it was one of those glorious moments in the history of documentaries. That's tremendous. Okay. But come on. Well, I think George the Animal Steel would beg to differ with you because of uh, the, the profanity that uh, Steve Austin needed to rely on. By the way, George Steele agrees with me that uh, Steamboat Savage was a tad overrated, didn't have a ton of psychology to it and everything like that. So if it were the animal that were the road agent, uh, Kyle, you might have seen a little more psychology in that match. <laughs> if it was me that was the road agent, he wouldn't have been out there. <laughs> That's awesome. But in 97, somewhere along the way, by that summer, Austin was the top guy and, 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 and destined to become the champion. He was not at the point of receiving the title yet. What we had here in 97, uh, you, you had uh, in, in the main event, uh, again, some of the top stars of the era, uh, Bret Hart and The Undertaker uh, wrestling for the title. We, we alluded to this previously, that The Undertaker was uh, in the main event picture in 97. He won... Uh, the WWF Championship at WrestleMania 13 from Psycho Sid. Here he drops it to Bret Hart in that uh, very uh, unbelievable match with Shawn Michaels as the uh, special guest referee. It played upon the real-life enmity between uh, Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels. This Uh, was so well done. It was, and it was uh, was right about, I'd say about the midpoint, more or less, of that red-hot U.S.-Canada storyline of the year. That was uh, it. Was right in the middle of that whole thing. Well, yeah, this tied so many things together. This this main event. Yeah. And what's funny is the dynamic between the two participants, the two wrestlers, mm-hmm. Brett and Undertaker, was probably the least interesting thing going on here. If right. you remember, the Undertaker was kind of because you talk about that fuzziness. Right. The Undertaker was the constant sort of. He was the one thing because you had Austin was taking off. You had Brett and Sean, your two big baby faces of the last couple of years, were both going heel. Right. Uh, Austin was a heel that became a face. Um, but Undertaker was that one good guy who was the constant. And then you had Brett doing his anti-U.S. shtick, which was <laughs> great. Sean had fallen out of favor with the fans and had actually been taken off TV to- on two different occasions yeah. for blow-ups. One for the losing my smile, two for the... Uh, he walked out after fighting with Brett backstage after the Sunny Days comment. When, when Brett had clumps of his hair in his hands. Yes. 
And they manage to get their stuff together and tie it all in this. It's not the best match ever by any means. It's not, you know, it's not even the Undertaker's. It's probably not even a top five Undertaker match. Certainly not anymore with what he's done at WrestleMania in recent years. But, you know, it, it's fun. You had, you had seen the first stuff of the Kane stuff, too, with Undertaker. Mm-hmm. He was kind of off in his own world, and he kind of was brought into the Brett Shawn dynamic, and it worked beautifully because I remember in the build of this match, you know, this, the stipulation was Brett could never wrestle in the U.S. again if he lost. Mm-hmm. Well, you knew he was going to win, and it was kind of his he – was, he was really over. Right. He was unbelievable as a heel, that U.S. can't – everyone who was involved in that – thinks that was, like, the most fun time in WWE. Austin Hart, they all say it. So you knew he was going to win, but the qu- the key was, you know, that's how real the hatred between Sean and Brett was, it felt. Mm-hmm. That you're like, God, how are they going to get Sean as this ref in a kayfabe sense to count to get Brett the win? Right. And they did it so be The match itself is kind of slow. I don't know if it's the best Brett, Brett Undertaker match. They 28-10, kinda, yeah. They, they had a better match, I think, at one night only, if I remember. But... And yet, though, probably the best match of The Undertaker's career to this point, at least high-profile match. Keep in mind, his match at WrestleMania was against Sid. So The Undertaker, although champion, was not in work-rate matches until this, this Until this point. Yes. This is like the first... Cause, and this cause might that, open... In, in a losing this effort, the door. This, this might open the door. Yeah, because, it was... So anyway, you know, the ending is so brilliant. If yeah. you, I mean, I, I really think you've got to watch this match, folks, just for the ending. You know, Brett is cheating. Michaels calls him out on he's Brett spits at Sean. Sean, the rule as the ref is, he can't favor Undertaker as he can't wrestle. So you mm-hmm. know, okay, well, Sean's going to do. So they have Sean loses cool, swings the chair at Brett, misses, hits the Undertaker. He does this awesome reaction, and the announcers sell it so well. Mm-hmm. I cannot put into words how great this they did that this was executed. And Brett covers, and Sean's like, oh, no, I, I think he like just curses right on the thing. Mm-hmm. And he goes, one, two, and he pauses. And it's awesome because him and Brett are looking right at each other. Mm-hmm. He just hits the three and just walks off. Mm-hmm. And the crowd is livid. That, was the per- that precipitated the Sean heel turn. You talk about Undertaker in there with workers. Right. The Undertaker-Sean feud uh, that carried the fall of 97 in the company, the Hell in the Cell match. And you talked about it off air. It was Sean's promo the next night that set that up because – Again, while Sean was playing somewhat into the crowd, it was not completely organic of that. It's not necess- if you're going to get fired, it's not inherently the actions of a heel to make that three count to save your own job. But it's how Sean played it in the interview that completed the process of turning the crowd against him. It was the, the, the seeds famous, of the original You're putting DS. this in my lap. That yes, one. that and, was brilliant. And the crowd was turning on him yeah. throughout 97 because – you know, the whole, you know, it was funny as a nostalgia act, and people saw he was a great baby face. He was right. a much better, I'll argue that when he came back 2002 to his retirement, he was a much better baby face than he was his first incarnation. I don't think it was close, actually, to in retrospect. Uh, yeah, exactly. Because he was better, but when he was kind of like a young guy dancing, you know, Brett hated it They a shoehorned lot, him into the Chippendales thing. And it was easy to see why the audience was turning on that. Right. So, it was just everyone played there. Everyone was a big winner here. Yeah. Everyone wound up being a big winner. And that, now I will say this: now we should definitely talk about Austin because that's yeah. So I think that's probably you know guys like us will obviously focus on how brilliantly the main event angle was executed. But the the big news to come out was Austin of this show. But they he, here's what the difference is between Summer Seven Ninety Seven and, and the Attitude Era WrestleManias because this is not an or Summer Slam. This is not an at, considered an Attitude Era. Mm-hmm. SummerSlam, that's you know, kind of when Austin wins the title uh, at WrestleMania the following year. No depth. Again, I mean, the depth here was, was, was non-existent. Right, right. I mean, you, you had the gang wars. I mean, this show was essentially made up of, you know, oh. every Heart Foundation match as a stipulation. You had Bulldog, Shamrock, Dog Food. Yeah. Uh, Pillman, Gold Dust, Loser Wears a Dress. Yeah. Uh, didn't the Road Warriors wrestle the Godwins on the Road show? Warriors wrestled the Godwins. Uh, part of it was it might have looked like there was a little bit less depth than there was because they made the very odd choice of starting off with what would have been one of the three or four most important matches, a steel cage match, Mankind defeating Triple yeah. H. Yeah, that, yeah, and this and was kind of when match. Foley was doing the three faces. Or no, yeah. Cactus Jack hadn't happened yet. He was only doing Dude Love yeah. at this point. And... That, that's a good match. You're right. Yeah. But it was it was odd. Who 
Do you remember how like almost sacrilegious it was at the time to open a pay per view with a steel cage match? That was kind of some- weird. Th- that's something that yeah. like now if they did it, you-, you wouldn't even think blink. Oh, they they've they've opened pay per views with elimination chamber matches and yeah, I was say they open raw yeah. with cage matches yeah, now for God's it's, sake. It's a weird thing, and this, this was uh, this was a milestone of sorts because it was one of the first great uh, matches for Triple H in the WWF. Yeah, he was he had won King of the Ring and he. He had China with him. Yeah. You know, Triple H, the general, is he always, you know, got more over with, with the addition of a woman during right. this period. I mean, he, he was not good, you know. Right. Uh, and then he kind of built up from here. He found himself, because he was Sean's friend, he wound up getting a lot of heat by kind of, He was Sean, look, it's funny when you looked at, the, I just, it was funny. I'm the only person, I think, who still thinks this every time the new DX comes out, like when right. they came up for Raw 1000. Mm-hmm. I remember, man, when Triple H was so lucky to be standing out there with Shawn Michaels. Yeah. And that's what, I'm sorry, Paul, okay? The best incarnation of DX is clearly when Sh- when Shawn was the lead dog. I always thought it was so jarring that they just, it, it was classic WWF in the sense of just ignoring what went on before. They just, they, they just canned the aristocrat act with no explanation. He just was coming out on TV in, in polo shirts and jeans and just goofing around. Yeah, but you know what was funny, though? What? Is I kind of just, like, I noticed at the time, I was like, I was kind of like, good. Like, I didn't yeah. want it. It was one of those things that's weird. I didn't want an explanation. I was like, you know, I'm just glad he's doing this now. E- like, even, even say, okay, I was pretending to be this guy to try to get myself over, but now I'm going to be myself. To eh. At least do something. Eh. I, I thought that was... At the risk of being Nelson nitpicker, I like to see things addressed. And like you said, gang warfare sucked. Los Bariquas DOA. Because here's the thing. Those Los Bariquas guys who'd all worked uh, in, in, in Puerto Rico uh, and with, the, you know, probably getting booked from time to time by that murderer, Jose Gonzalez. But regardless. Whoa. Yeah, yeah. Bruiser Brody, never forget. But uh, those guys at least could work. They were getting dragged down to the level of DOA. Yeah, he, like it was just. See, I'm gonna take this from. I'm gonna punch and kick. I'm gonna, kick. you know, I'm gonna take the, uh, a different approach from this and shock yeah. you. I think DOA kind of got hosed in this feud. I can't believe I'm gonna make this. I'm gonna tell you why. They were getting a paycheck, and that's more than they deserved. Okay, from a work rate perspective, I completely agree. But yes. here's the thing: they were the Barik was had no chance because they were sort of the second heel group. And let's just call. Let's just let's just talk turkey here, Rick Morris. Yeah. Okay. Wrestling fans, okay? Yeah. Like Republicans, people you know well, when given the choice between the white gang, the black gang, and the Puerto Rican gang, they're going to cheer for the white gang. Right. And this, I, I read about this at the time, and, and I remember it was kind of true. I think they were, first of all, the gang rules was, it's kind of interesting in an insensitive angle that you would choose to be sensitive when you're, you know, it's basically like a race war you yeah. created. It was a the, prison race war angle. The most the, overt one in wrestling history, I would say. But here's the thing. They were so self-conscious, like, oh, God, I, we can't make the white guys, like, the huge he, baby faces Typical in this one. Typical WWF. So they kind of had them lose a lot, and it's sort of, because they got no love. Like, you know, Savio Vega, remember that, like, brief time period where he was the king of the three-way dance? Right. Okay, and then the nation domination was always the most over group, because they had the, the better guys, but... I think the DOA sort of because, like, I think reverse racism caused the DOA a push. <laughs> the only thing I remember about being uh, king of the three-way dance in a Puerto Rican neighborhood, red beans and rice didn't miss her. Huh? <laughs> you are out of line, uh, thank sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, typical WWF screwing this one up here. I mean, you know what? It's well, almost, I don't think they, they – well, You know what it's shades of, though? Ironically, in the, in the other gray. production, <laughs> you know, well, two years later, West Texas Rednecks. Let's try to shoehorn them into being the heels. That was just a – that was just stupidity. Memo to wrestling promoters in any if – you're, if you're going to be tasteless enough to, be, to do a race-based feud – Make the white guys the baby faces. There's a lot more white guys than non-whites in this country. Go with the majority. Go with the flow. If you're going to be that insensitive, if you're going to go there, and I would argue for a number of reasons that you shouldn't, largely because, my God, tastelessness should at least be entertaining. These these angles aren't entertaining. No, well, it was just a lot of bad people. I mean, yeah. you know, I mean obviously the nation domination 
Rocky, yeah, just, you, you know, know, The Rock wasn't even in the group yet. I think oh. he kind of debuted. Right. I think Ahmed Johnson was still in the nation these, at this the, point. These guys trying to cut promos in a way oh, that this. doesn't seem to cross a racial line. I mean, I haven't seen acting like that since Freddie got fingered. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> by the way, go with the majority. I hope you keep that in mind come November, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where the baby face will not be the white guy, I can assure you. <laughs> I'm not referring to that guy as a baby face in any sense. No, you're telling me. Uh, x pac <laughs> uh, Yeah, exactly. That's what he's got with me. But I'll tell you what. What's very interesting here, we've talked about Steve Austin a little bit. Uh, the other big thing on this card here, the semi-main event. And, again, it, it's one of these things where... Again, it was it was Owen Hart who was sort of, that he was wrestling, who was sort of a proxy for Bret Hart, who was the, the head of the, of, of the stable of uh, the Hart Foundation. But interestingly enough, you talk about how much times have changed, and it wouldn't take too many years down the road past that. The semi-main event and intercontinental title match. This is like oh. the 11, 11.59, I would say, of when the intercontinental title really meant anything. Yeah, you know, I'll say this. Triple H, we'll talk about this. Oh, Triple H a, rock, you're right. The next year was yeah. big. Okay. And, and it had its moments. At, but, you know, I think, for, I, think he, I think that's not a, I think that's a very uh, good point. I mean, if, it, if it's not 11.59, it's 11.45. Yeah, okay, uh, 11.45. I think you're right about that. Time was ticking. It was, yeah. But I this think, was a, I mean, this was a big-time intercontinental title match. Well, and the thing is, too, so often co- companies are – screwed by the stipulations they put on a match in the end because of an emergency situation the company because this was a kiss my ass stipulation match so where there would be consequences if they went the other way and owen hart just did the easy thing and and went for the one two three they ended up and, and i don't i don't want to speak harshly of what's a life and death situation but I'm just gonna. I have no choice but to say, from an honesty standpoint, they completely exposed the business here. When Steve yes. Austin suffered what would, I guess, subsequently maybe it would just be a severe stinger, whatever it was with his neck, whatever the extent of the neck injury was. On the botched pile driver. On the botched by Owen pile Hart. driver. Yeah, yeah. Of where Owen you should have just done the tombstone. It would have been safer. But wanted to do the sit down one. And I've heard. I mean, that like Steve Austin thought that Owen was ribbing him right up to the end that he was going to deliver that kind of a pile driver. Steve thought it was going to be the, you know, the tombstone type. But anyways. The, th- the thing here, he's lying on the mat motionless. He manages to mumble to the referee that he can't move, whatever. I mean, a- again, I don't, I don't want to risk sounding insensitive because, you know, it, it, Steve Austin could have been paralyzed here, but one of the worst exposing the, 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 the business things ever. The roll-up on Owen, and Owen is laying there. and yeah, It's bad, and here's the thing. Couple... I, we, we probably sound like Dick saying that, but, no. but it's true. I'm going to say why we're not. Why? I just watched the Austin documentary, the recent one, which is very good, by the way, kids. Go out and watch it. The I, I can't remember the name. It's whatever the be, the Stone Cold Truth on the best mm-hmm. superstar ever, whatever it's called. The bottom line, it's something. It's good. He ripped on the end. He's basically like, look, like I mean, he's like, yeah, he's like, I did the roll up, looked like crap. Mm-hmm. I think he even said, well, I think he said it looked like, you know, it looked like you know what. Mm-hmm. Um, but what's interesting to me. Is that they still cared about st- this? Just dawned on me when you were uh, going through that soliloquy. They actually cared that much about stipulations. Yeah, they did. Now, they they would have no problem calling an audible and just for, and just saying, ah, well, he doesn't have to kiss his ass. Well, what it would have been. Uh, but back then, sti- this was a big time stipulation. And for, for those who don't know, the stipulation was that Austin had would if he didn't win the Intercontinental Title would kiss Owen Hart's ass. I mean, but, but, but I remember thinking at the time, you got a way around that that wouldn't kill the heat. I mean, what you do is you know, he gives, like, one quick peck and then just bites. And, like, they make it look like he's clamping down and you have, like, well, a blood do that with the neck. I don't think he's going to do that with the neck. Well, I mean, maybe no. I what you do is like you put it off till he returns to TV. Oh, you you acknowledge yeah. that uh, that you, uh, you have to you have to you have to first of all you have to answer for why your big hero did the clean job, and it becomes, okay, he was hurt, he was injured, whatever. When he comes back to TV, he's kissing my ass. Do it, and then where he just bite. Then, Imagine the facials that Owen, because Owen was pretty good at doing facial things here. If, if, Owen was, or if Austin was allegedly biting him very hard on his ass, the look of bloody murder that Owen Hart would be, I mean, 
they, I understand. So that you're, it's, you're being it's, angle for Raw with Steve Austin to bite on Hart's ass is what you're telling me. Well, that w- and that would have been in character with Austin. Here's the thing. It would have been totally in character. I'm actually going to agree with you right here on the fly. Yeah. Because all, they, they wound up taking the title off him anyway, so it was meaningless for him to win. I actually think they should just kind of stop the match to acknowledge the injury. Yeah, that was the other and option. And I'm going to tell you why. Because you're right, it would have built intrigue when he came back. Excuse me, Steve Austin. You know, Owen would have come across as very insensitive. It would have got good heat. You still have to kiss my ass. Yeah. And it would have played in perfect memory because they had Austin doing all. He was stunning everyone. Right. He could. He would have just not honored it. People would have liked it. Right. And it, would, it could have been part of that big build up to him stunning McMahon, Vince McMahon right. for the first time. I think we've stumbled upon. So they should have just gone a non finish for one of the very yeah. few times that both you and I agree they should have just done a non finish. Yeah. I will say this though. Yeah. Before the whole botch pile driver happened, mm-hmm. this was uh, on pace to be a match of the year contender. Yeah. And it's still arguably the best match of the night. Two amazing workers. I would yeah, say I would say the, la- the last two matches are both of them at three and three quarter star to four star range. There's no gr- unlike the first, unlike every other. Well, Summer Seventy Three. It's interesting that the two WrestleManias of the five we talked about today, the two that I liked the most are the two that didn't have match o- OMG MOTYCs, mm-hmm. but. They had a little more to them because this didn't have the match of the year contender that that you know you saw with Brett Owen in '94, right. Sean Razor '95, Sean Vader '96. But this is certainly a more enjoyable show, and the key is for the first time, uptick, positive right. momentum. Right. WWE's come back. Mick Foley said this before. It was not reflected in the ratings, but the guys in the WWF locker room had the feeling that at this point. They were the better show. They clearly lacked the depth. WCW, yeah. I mean, depth was incredible at this time period yeah. compared to WWF's. But the main events, what was going on in the main events in almost every pay-per-view in 97 was great. You and I have disagreed on this. I felt that WCW was getting stale by the fall of 97. I thought they dragged on the NWO thing a little bit too long. So you and I have not agreed on that particular thing. I, I, yeah. I still think they, they were. They, 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 Star K97 did its biggest number ever. I, I, I think. The company's biggest number yeah, ever. I, well, they, well, people wanted to see the payoff to the Sting thing and what, what a letdown that ended up being. But I'm not going to say they were the better pro- product at this time. I think WCW stale or not was still a little better. But the gap was closing in terms of quality. And, and let's just bring it around on this note. Okay. Yeah. I just want to say on that note. Okay. Just, just this wet, let's wax a little nostalgic here because okay. that's well, ultimately this is all about fun and sure. remembering walks down memory lane and stuff like that. Yeah. How great. You kids. I mean, that's to be like you damn kids, like wave <laughs> you off the line. Do you remember in the pre-DVR era how crazy it was to watch wrestling on Monday nights during 1997? Like, yeah. it was like, it, like, I would just like flip back like insanely. I right, think right. by one point. Uh, Chad, Re- we were like taping one, or during the summer months, Nitro they replayed it if you remember, right? Uh, like right afterwards, right? And I think I would watch Raw nine to eleven, and then watch the replay because it was. Just, but like at the same time, I would flip back because you just didn't want to miss anything. Like this right. is when guys were jumping; it was crazy. Right. This was such. A, and when you said like it was real, the gap had closed. Yeah. It just kind of made me remember just how fun it was to it watch was. wrestling. It was. Period. I mean, it, 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 it'll, it'll never be like that ever again. It was the quickest because Nitro, ex- did, they expanded to three hours around this time. I think it was still a two-hour show in this, most of the summer of 97, right. I think. Well, I mean, and I'll, but it was the quick, for me, high school as a high school senior, yeah. it was the quickest two hours of television every week ever. It, it, it was amazing. And, and here's why it'll never be like that again. Because you, you can only go through things for the first time once, obviously by definition. And there were so many unprecedented things about that. I mean, let's, let's say, for example, I mean, and, and, and right now today, it's relatively speaking because for most of their history, they've absolutely sucked. But TNA's gotten kind of an upturn right now. Let's say TNA keeps getting much better and much better and much better. And let's say somebody like your boy Warren Buffett goes and buys them. And they can, they can buy up all the great indie talent. And they get a prime spot on Monday nights, and they're going head-to-head with the WWE. It will never be like it was then. Because everyone will because, compare it. Everyone will be like, oh, do you remember the first Monday Night Wars? But not only that. Not only that. The biggest thing about this with the Monday Night Wars, and, and, and some people might argue with me when I say that it is the biggest thing. But to me, the biggest thing is that you almost never 
had to any extent before that the curtain pulled back. You you had so many things that were completely just I mean to to even acknowledge Vince McMahon as the owner of the WWF on camera openly instead of just like a quiet reference to it like there was like a live wire in like 96 where uh, I think, like, they had him on, like, the week after the JR thing. But even then, they weren't, like, super playing up OMG Vince McMahon, owner of the company. They just played him up as an authority figure more than they generally did. But they pulled back the curtain so much and everything like that, and the business was exposed. Work shoots were, were uh, unheard of before then, let alone regular shoots, you know, which you had at least one or two of. Mm-hmm. You know, Scott Steiner doing what he did uh, – you know, with uh, this show sucks, you should watch Stone Cold instead. Yeah, well, that was that just the, never the wheels. Happened. Yeah, yeah. And you're right. It'll it'll never be like that. I mean, you romanticize about something like that. And, and it did damage, though, because you couldn't continue to top the pace they were at. That's why wrestling after the, the, the thing. That's why the era sucks, comparatively speaking, and will probably well into the future, because they just upped the ante so much. They, it was I mean, five to six years of insanity. Yeah, they were just blowing through, and they needed to. Yeah. Every good idea you could come up with, and it was, it was a lot of new ideas, and it really was. I mean, when you look back. Work rate, insane garbage matches. And just the things. Every barrier. And raw, the promos. I mean, yeah, promos. I just watched that Austin. Talk, I mean, the things, I mean, he was, his promos every week were just so incredible, and it yeah. just. Yeah, it won't ever happen again. And you know what I like here is that we actually ended, you know, it, it felt this whole summer, like every t- year that mm-hmm. we've talked about so far, well, yeah, business was down from the previous year. Yep. Like from 88 to 96, yep. like business declined every it, it. I love it. It's cool because for the first time, we're ending on a positive we're note. We're teasing the great era yet to come. Yeah, the next one, it's all, I would call the... Next, the next time we convene, Ricky, it's, we're mm-hmm. going to be talking the Attitude Era, SummerSlams 98 2 yep. I call that the golden age of SummerSlams because, yep. you know, we talked about what are the worst ones. Yep. When you take a look at the best ones, yep. it's basically 99. I wouldn't put in that category. Mm-hmm. I would sub 92 in for that. But 98 and then 2000, 2001, 2002, yep. those are like your best SummerSlams ever, and I can't wait to talk about they, it. They pretty much are. Last note for this one here. We talked about this. Uh, And I'm going to go back to a previous discussion that we'd had when we were talking about some of the best workers of the 90s. Austin and Owen Hart, arguably top five overall workers for the 90s. You could at least make a very strong argument for that. It's no wonder that that was a great match until it got cut short because other than Brett Owen in 94, I don't think you ever had an elite worker versus elite worker match at SummerSlam in this era. I mean, those are like the two matches. Is there anything else that even comes close to those two? The other great matches that we've talked about today, Sean Razor, but that was aided by the ladder match. And yeah. Ra- and, and Scott Hall is I'm not. I'm just talking about the both caliber workers. Scott, no. Scott Hall is not an elite worker. Right. And then Sean, good worker. Sean he's when, a good worker. Went when, sober. Yeah, but, but Sean Vader. Uh, Vader, great big man, but a great big man, not right. elite worker. Right. Um, I mean, he's better than Scott Hall. But they're pretty close, but yeah, I that's... would give Vader the nod. Vader certainly in his heyday. Yeah, uh, but you're right. As far as that great worker versus great worker match of the ones we've talked about today, yeah, I, I'll put that one up. You know, I mean, you had Sean Perfect, which was a catastrophe in '93. Yeah, that that that's like number three on the list, at least on paper. But it fell apart. It was crap. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it, it's funny that this match had a very serious neck injury at the yeah. end of it and was still significantly better. Yeah, than Sean Perfect. <laughs> I mean, that's unbelievable. That shows you how bad Perfect was at that point. Uh, it was. Cared. It was. Although, uh, rest in peace, uh, Kurt Hennig. Yes. But, uh, yeah, yeah, that was. Rest in peace, Owen Hart. Owen Hart as well, yeah. Ugh. Mm-hmm. What, a, what a sad era in that sense, Yeah, too. yeah. We're, we're, we're bringing ourselves down yeah, after bringing ourselves Ricky, up. Ricky, we're supposed to be happy here. Let's you know, do a well, shot here. Let's do a well, shot. I got some Patron yeah. over there. <laughs> we'll do that. All right. Well, uh, again, though, let's, let's, let's conclude it on a happy note. Next one out, as we said, the Attitude Era. It doesn't get any better than that. Love it. As we bring the show to a close, we would like to extend our deepest gratitude to NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, All Clear Channel affiliates, TNT, TBS, USA, UPN, Deadspin.com, YouTube.com, YTMND.com, MySpace.com, various blogs, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, IamBoard.com, Billboard.com, Google.com, ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN News, ESPN Classic, NBA TV, NFL Network, Sports Time Ohio. 
Ohio, Athlon Magazine, Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, The Boomerang Channel, QVC, BET, The Spice Channel, Steno Notebooks, Manwich, Papermate Office Supplies, Waitresses, Strippers, Bartenders, Garbage Men, Janitors, Microwave Popcorn, The Writers of The Office, Scrubs, Entourage, My Name is Earl, Oz, Metalocalypse and the Boondocks, Aquafina, and The Periodic Table of Elements.